Um, first, I'm just going to say thanks again for the organizers, for Nick uh, and Kia, for uh, putting together a cool day, uh, really showing the breadth of Oxford neuroscience. It's always fun to see this. Um, uh, so this session is about computation and computational neuroscience. Um, in Oxford, we don't have a bespoke unit for computational neuroscience, but we do have lots of talented people thinking about computation embedded throughout all the departments. And um, in some senses, that's uh, obviously, um, obviously we can be jealous of places like the Gatsby, but in some senses, we also benefit from that because computation really is embedded in everything uh, the brain does. Um, and and uh, having it, um, so uh, so distributed throughout the university really means that we uh, make a broad range of collaborations. And I think that uh, we've put together a session that really uh, shows uh, that today. Uh, so we've got people talking about um, uh, really uh, deep issues about computation uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in basic neural processing units, all the way through to um, how computational ideas can uh, be helpful in, in surgery and uh, in psychiatry. Uh, so um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and I'm just gonna start by introducing Andrew Sachs, who I think has literally just arrived, um, uh, missing his introduction. Um, and um, Andrew, uh, just a quick word about Andrew. Um, he's unusual, I think, even amongst computational people because he really tries to get um, at theory at really uh, at truths that will always be there that can be proved analytically uh, unlike people who try to build models and stuff like myself um, and so um, uh, I hope you enjoy the truths that will be revealed in the next 20 minutes over to Andrew. Thank you. Andrew. Yes, can you hear me? All right, um, I'll assume you can see my screen unless I hear otherwise. So thank you very much for the, the chance to speak here. Um, the work I'm gonna talk about today is about learning structure from experience in an uncertain world. And this is joint work with Wayne Sun, Madhu Advani, Nelson Spruston, and James Fitzgerald. And uh, Wayne and Nelson and James are at Genelia Research Campus and Madhu is now at Apple Incorporated. Okay, so we need many things in order to survive in the world, many cognitive abilities, uh, but the two that I want to focus on in this talk are memorization and generalization. And to fix what I mean by that for the purposes of this talk, suppose you're a thirsty mouse, you might be in your home environment, and you might uh, know that there's always this one path you run, uh, and as you run along that path, eventually you'll see this distinctive flower, and that's when you hang a left, and eventually you come to your water source. Now, you could have also been scared away by a predator from your home environment. You're in some novel local environment you've never actually been in before. That same flower no longer predicts where water is. So what are you going to do? Well, maybe you come to a situation like this and you understand sort of the 3D shape of the terrain and you say, I'm going to look for depressions. I'm going to follow downward slopes and try to find water that way. And uh, maybe later on, you realize that there's some uh, water plants that you know usually grow near water, and so eventually you also find the water source. So the left-hand side of this is um, memorization, which is useful in repetitive situations, and the right-hand side is generalization, which is useful in novel situations. And of course, both of these are relying on prior experience, so they're forms of memory. Uh, and it's not just mice, although well, we have these processes too in humans, where very loosely speaking, um, you can think of the left-hand side as episodic-like memory, where, for instance, you might be worried about where you parked your car this morning, whereas the right-hand side would be more uh, semantic memory, for instance, where you generally find parking spaces. So a lot of facts about memorization and generalization have been woven into the standard theory of systems consolidation. And this posits that memories initially form in the hippocampus, outlined in blue there. And then over time, perhaps through replay, uh, memories transfer into your neocortex. And this is really a temporal process. So early on, hippocampus is driving memory recall. And at the end, neocortex is driving memory recall. And the standard theory says also that it doesn't need to be a straight transfer of exactly what you've memorized. Um, maybe in this process, memories are transformed in some way to aid generalization. 
And there's lots of evidence and, uh, you know, the interesting uh, evidence that sort of supports this view going back to Scoville and Milner and patient HM, uh, which essentially shows that when you lose your hippocampus, recent memories can take a profound hit. And the uh, intuition is that um, the, the memory was stored initially in hippocampus and hasn't had time to transfer out yet. And so a recent memory will be um, uh, impacted heavily, whereas a remote memory will be relatively spared. So this graded retrograde amnesia curve is one of the key pieces of evidence for the standard theory. The trouble is, there's now a growing range of data indicating that you can see much more diverse patterns of amnesia curves. And one in particular, which challenges the standard theory is flat retrograde amnesia. This is the observation that for some memories, apparently you see roughly equal hits for recent and remote memory, indicating that this um, information was sort of permanently hippocampal dependent. Didn't matter when you lost your hippocampus, it still harmed the memory performance. So this has sparked a big debate in the field have people still happy broadly with the standard uh, systems consolidation theory, but you have people saying, hey, it's time to reconsider it. Have other people saying it's time to reconsider it again. Um, people proposing new theories like multiple trace theory and saying maybe that's already been refuted. And so I think still we're very much searching for principles that will help explain this uh, diversity of amnesia curves that we see and understand how memory components are stored in uh, the brain and evolve over time. So what I'm going to propose in this talk, just to foreshadow where I'm going, I'm going to propose that systems consolidation is intricately regulated to optimize generalization specifically. And I'll show that this has some intricate consequences, which we think can start to explain this diversity of amnesia curves. All right, so how are we going to formalize this? Well, I'm going to take you through our teacher-student notebook, which is how we've formalized it. And the high-level framing is essentially as follows. Imagine you're wandering around in your environment. As you do so, you're having experiences that generate distributed patterns of activity across all of the neurons in your brain. They're very complex. They're recurrently connected. There's all kinds of things going on. So to get some tractability, we're kind of going to zoom in. So if you imagine on this vertical axis here, you have uh, neurons and then we have possible experiences, we're gonna imagine that some little piece of cortex, its job is to receive just a subset of these neurons activity as its input. And it, what it's trying to do is predict the associated output. So this might be, for instance, the inputs might be the visual representation of seeing a dog and the output might be a neuron in the auditory pathway that hears a caregiver say, look, that's a dog. And then some little piece of neocortex is trying to learn the associations that in the future, when you see a dog, you know the word that's associated to it. This is a very simple little formalization. And what it boils down to is you have a high dimensional input and you're learning to predict an output. So now that we've pulled this little piece out, um, we're going to model that using this teacher student notebook. And so the first component is a teacher. And this will specify basically how the correlations arise between inputs and outputs. It's the generative model of the environment. And uh, the next piece is this, what I'll call the student, which I'll loosely associate with neocortex. And its job is to learn to mimic the teacher. So the teacher generates representations T1 and associated outputs T2, and the student is trying to learn that same input output mapping. And then we're also gonna give it the benefit of a notebook, which will be something like the hippocampus, that can do fast one-shot memorization. Now, I think these ideas generalize. You could put lots of things in these boxes, but I'm just going to tell you very briefly what we put in the boxes so that you know what we're doing uh, in detail here. Um, so for the teacher, I have a shallow linear neural network. For the student, I also have a shallow linear neural network. So this is one neural network learning to imitate another. Uh, and the notebook, I'm going to use a hot field associative memory, sort of a recurrent standard associative memory um, from theoretical neuroscience. And if you really like the details, we're basically drawing all of these parameters from Gaussians. And the two key parameters of the environment are how much noise uh, we're injecting, so how, sort of how reliable the rule is that we're learning, and uh, how much experience you're given before you start uh, being asked questions. Um, we're training the student with gradient descent, and this Hotfield network is really standard 
Hotfield network trained with heavy on learning. Okay, so what do we get from this uh, framework? Well, already we can have a lot of different interaction patterns between these three elements that can support learning. So things start when you experience something. And in this model, that means the teacher generates patterns T1 and T2 and supplies them to the student, S1 and S2. Um, but we now have the option of storing that information through heavy on learning into our notebook so that we could possibly uh, reuse it later for replay. And what this would allow us to do is push the exact experiences that we'd had earlier in the day, say, back into our student in order to do learning. And so we don't just need to learn um, when we originally experience this uh, item, we can also learn offline through um, replayed experience. And the learning here is error corrective learning uh, in this pathway uh, of the student where it's sort of trying to learn to recreate the mapping from the teacher. Okay, um, so in this framework, uh, the reason why I chose those components that I chose before, I mean, you probably saw they were very simple, but the advantage of the simplicity is that we can actually analyze uh, the performance of this system end to end. So um, how all of those interactions together wind up impacting memorization or generalization. So to start with, to talk about um, the, what the notebook can do itself alone. On the y-axis here, I'm plotting the error that the system achieves. So lower is better. And on the x-axis, we have time where here I'm investigating a replay scenario. So as time passes, you're seeing more and more replay events out of the notebook. And the notebook itself, the replay events don't change what it's doing. So it just has a low error throughout the whole time, indicating that it's successfully memorized the batch of experience that it's received from the environment. But in the student, its memory performance on the exact example seen will look like this blue curve. So it's decreasing over time because you're replaying information from the notebook. Um, that's sort of the standard picture of systems consolidation. And now we can also track in red here, the generalization performance. So how well the student is doing on some never before seen example generated by the teacher. And you can see it's a little worse than the memorization performance, but it's still in this case looking pretty good. And again, um, you know, the benefit of this framework is we actually can write down the equations for these curves as a function of the signal to noise ratio in the environment, the amount of experience um, you're given and the interaction policy, whether you're doing replay or online only learning and so on. All right, so what can we do with this? Well, one thing we noticed was that systems consolidation is not always beneficial. And its benefit depends on the level of predictability in the relationship that you're learning. This is because there's a tension between memorization and generalization. So if you're learning a highly predictable relationship, then things just look pretty good. So you can see that as you continue replaying, the student uh, memory error goes down, as does the generalization performance. More replay is just better. You should just keep doing it. But if you're learning from a somewhat predictable relationship, picture is much more complicated. While the memorization performance just steadily drops, the generalization performance actually turns around, starts going back up here. And this is because you're sort of overfitting to spurious correlations in the specific batch of data that you are replaying rather than learning the generic rule. And for a very highly unpredictable relationship, almost any amount of replay will be detrimental from a generalization performance perspective. So this motivated us to ask, what would happen if you change the replay process and instead of just replaying as long as you could, you adaptively regulate it based on the predictability of the relationship that you're learning. What that means is for highly predictable relationships, there's no change. You just replay as much as you want. But for somewhat predictable relationships, you would actually want to stop consolidating at the point where the generalization error turns around and starts to increase. And that means that you will no longer uh, get worse at generalization, but also means your memory improvements will stop at that point. And so for highly unpredictable relationships, that's going to happen almost immediately. And you can see that almost no memory has been transferred into the student. So what does this mean in terms of um, experimental uh, consequences? 
Well, um, here's the idea across the top. I'm going to show what happens when you optimize for memory, which is sort of the standard theory of systems consolidation. And on the bottom, I'm going to show what happens when you optimize for generalization. And I'm going to show this using a memorization score to sort of map it back to experiments. So one means you're doing a good job in memorization. Zero means you're doing a bad job. And this curve here, the blue and black lines, are what happens when you're using the full system. So you can see its memory is quite good. But then if we take away the notebook, simulating a hippocampal lesion, you get these um, cyan lines. And you can see that those, uh, you know, the memorization improves over time. But if I just pull out two points, a recent memory and a remote memory, and connect those two points with these red curves, this gives us a graded retrograde amnesia curve reminiscent of what you see in experiments. And regardless of the signal to noise ratio, we always see graded retrograde amnesia. However, if we optimize for generalization, now we stop um, training these models after a certain amount of time. And so we actually see a diversity of amnesia curves where highly predictable information uh, shows strong retrograde amnesia, but unpredictable information shows almost flat retrograde amnesia. And so we can reproduce sort of both of these curves as lying along a spectrum of different predictabilities in the environment. Okay, so just to sort of conclude here, um, basically what we're proposing is that complete consolidation might only occur in cases where it aids generalization. And so we used to have this view where uh, recent memories transferred into remote memories roughly just as a function of time. And we're now suggesting maybe the axis here, which is relevant is in fact predictability of experience. And this can help reconcile puzzling observations in the field. All right, so uh, to conclude, we propose systems consolidation may be optimized for generalization. I think it's interesting that too much consolidation can be bad. This I think is maybe not widely appreciated because it can learn spurious relationships. And if you um, regulate consolidation in order to uh, combat this effect, then it's a quite intricate regulation that results and you get diverse amnesia curves out with some parts of memories remaining permanently hippocampal dependent, namely the unpredictable parts. And so we think this perspective might start getting towards a new view on um, the taxonomy of declarative memories where you're framing things really in terms of the utility of their content for generalization. Uh, so with that, let me just thank the people who contributed to this, um, in particular James and uh, very talented postdoc Wayne on Sun and uh, my funding. And I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, so um, thanks very much indeed. We have a question uh, from Yoram. Um, uh, a super talk, by the way, I thought it was really interesting. Um, uh, do you have any idea what sort of neural system might keep track of the predictability associated with different memories? Yeah, it's a great question. So first thing to say is this theory al already makes testable predictions, even without knowing how that would be implemented. So that's one thing, um, you know, a, a theory doesn't need to address everything, but I agree, it's a very interesting question. And we have some proposals, but they have to be empirical. You know, all of this is, has the status of tentative hypothesis. So you could imagine that you'd have a meta learning system that would be learning the reliability of different um, uh, sources of information. Um, you could also imagine that sometimes this decision would be made over evolutionary timescales. So you've sort of decided what information to treat as reliable and whatnot. And then the third comment is, we've been operating under, under the assumption that you know the exact optimal regulation, um, regulation process because you know the predictability, but presumably you would actually make errors. And so you could push it around. It has to be inferred essentially from experience. But yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so um, there's two more questions. I am, I'm going I'm to give you a couple more minutes because I waffled a bit at the start uh, beyond 11 and, the, and they're coming in and it's good to see questions. Um, so I'm, I'm actually just going to choose, hang on a second, I'm just going to choose um, uh, Max Van S's question first because it relates, to, I think it's broad. It says, are you aware of any empirical evidence that shows more hippocampal replay for reliable memories? But let me just qualify that by saying, earlier you said, that it made predictions. And I just wanted to say, how do you operate, what do you mean by, you, how do you operationalize in, in the real world what's gonna be a predictable memory and what's not? And I guess that's a prerequisite for, for, Matt's, question, uh, for uh, Matt's question. Yes, great. You've, you've 
found a backup slide. So yeah, so this I think is really important. The way that I framed it was as um, a noisy teacher. So predictability means genuine randomness, right? And um, you could do that in experimental context. If you, for instance, let's, let's take a rodent paradigm. You have a rodent running towards a destination. It receives an input stimulus that predicts the right destination, destination but um, the, there's actual non-determinism in the rule linking the input stimulus to the right destination. That would be a noisy teacher. And that's what I've been talking about. It's one form of um, non-predictability. But you can also just have a complex teacher. So if you have a linear student and you have a non-linear teacher, like a sigmoidal output function, this is a fully deterministic setting, but um, it's unpredictable from the perspective of the student because it can't implement that function. And, and, and the flip is true too. If you had a nonlinear teacher, uh, sorry, a nonlinear student learning from a linear teacher, it's not about linearity or nonlinearity, it's just about mismatch then you can also get the same thing. And then another version, which is probably relevant to psychology is partial observability. So you may be that um, you do have all the information to get the answer right, but you've chosen to attend. This is an internal decision you've made. You've chosen to attend only a subset of your inputs. And if you choose right, that might go well for you, but anything that you're not looking at, so these black parts is going to look like noise because you can't, you, you're just not observing those parts of the stimulus. So these are three ways in which you can generalize this idea of predictability. And they all generate the same phenomenology of low predictability causing overtraining and high predictability being uh, acceptable. Cool. Okay. I think we've used the, I mean, you have, uh, you've, there's loads of questions and I'm going to uh, maybe Nick can forward to you or I can forward them to you in the, or you can answer them. Uh, Great. Like, um, I, um, uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, Rafael now, who uh, everybody will know is a key player in many parts of what's with neuroscience and needs no introduction, but has made deep contributions to reinforcement learning and Bayesian uh, understanding of how, how circuits uh, solve phase equation, et cetera, et cetera, many other things. Uh, here is uh, Rafael Bogac um, talking about uh, uncertainty of rewards, I think. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So as we heard from Andrew, understanding reliability of outcomes is very important to optimize animal behavior. And during this talk, I would like to discuss how uncertainty in rewards can be learned in the neural circuits of the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia play important role in action selection and reinforcement learning. Information processing in the basal ganglia is strongly modulated by dopaminergic neurons, which die in Parkinson's disease. The role of the basal ganglia in learning about reward variability is suggested by surprising observation that dopaminergic medications for Parkinson's disease increase tendon, have the side effects of increasing tendency for gambling. And the role of dopamine in uh, triggering uh, risk preferences has been also studied in the lab. Uh, in one study, rats were given a choice between two levers with the same average reward, a safe lever, always giving one pellet, and a riskier lever that could give four or no pellets. And it has been observed that after injection of dopamine agonists, the rats tended to select an option with a larger reward variability. So we wish to understand this phenomena and we developed a model describing how these neural circuits in the basal ganglia can keep track of reward variability and why dopamine affects risky choices. So during this talk, I will first uh, review the key aspects of the basal ganglia, then present uh, our computational model and then discuss our recent work on testing predictions of the model on neural activity and behavior. The largest part of the basal ganglia is the striatum. It receives input from the cortex and projects to the thalamus via other basal ganglia nuclei. There are two main types of neurons in the striatum. The go neurons send effectively excitatory input to the thalamus and they facilitate movements, 
while the no-go neurons send effectively inhibitory input to the thalamus and they suppress movement. So let us consider a population of striatal neurons selected for a particular action. And the note, the synaptic weights of go neurons by G and synaptic weights of no-go neurons by N. Computational models typically assume that this corticostriatal weights encode the expected reward from the action, which I will denote by Q. And previous models had proposed that this action value is encoded in the difference between the weights of go and no-go neurons. The, the striatal neurons are very strongly modulated by dopamine, but the go and no-go neurons express different types of dopaminergic receptors, so they react to dopamine in opposite weights. And dopamine has two types of effect on the striatal neurons. First, it changes their excitability. So for example, when the dopamine level is high, it facilitates the, uh, increases the excitability of go neurons and suppresses the no-go neurons. And secondly, dopamine has also important role in reinforcement learning. So as Ben has already mentioned, um, some population of dopaminergic neurons encode reward prediction error, which is defined as the difference between reward, which I denote by R, and the expected reward Q. And this reward prediction error then triggers synaptic plasticity in the striatum. And experimental data suggest that when the dopamine level is high, as could occur during unexpected reward, the weights of go neurons increase and the weights of no go neurons decrease. So this action can be selected in the future. By contrast, when the dopamine level is decreased below the baseline, as may occur during disappointment, the no go weights are increased and the go weights are reduced. So this action will be suppressed in the future. So we should understand how such circuit could keep track of both mean reward and reward variability. So we developed a computational uh, model of this circuit. And um, a former MSc student, John Michael, developed a model which could learn the distribution of rewards. And in his model, the mean reward is encoded in the difference between the weights of go and no-go neurons while the variability of rewards is encoded in their sum. So let me describe the synaptic plasticity rules in the model. So the model assumes that when reward prediction error is positive, then the go weights are increased. By contrast, when the reward is lower than expected, the no-go weights are increased. And to uh, prevent the weights from increasing to infinity, the weights decay with time. So let me explain how such rules can lead to encoding of reward variability in the sum of the go and no go weights. So let us consider a case where the rewards are consistent. So imagine that during lockdown, you tried a company for a grocery delivery and each time they bring you nice quality food. So at the beginning, you are pleasantly surprised. You increase your go weights but you are never disappointed, so you never increase your no-go weights. Then you also try a different company, which has the same quality on average, but it's more valuable. So when the fruits are amazing, you increase your go weights a lot. But when they are disappointing, then you also increase the no-go weights. Now, if you compare the weights at the end of the learning episode, uh, then the sum of the go and no go weights is higher when the rewards are valuable. The same effect is illustrated here in a simulation of the model. So the green and red curves show the changes in the go and no go weights over simulated trials. And in all the panels, the expected reward was the same, but the variability of the reward was increasing towards the right. And you can see that the difference between the go and no go weights is preserved, but both weights are elevated when the rewards are valuable. So how does this model explain the risk seeking on medication? So let us consider a gamble where you can win or lose one pound with equal probability. Playing such gamble will increase both go and no go weights 
uh, with the same magnitude on average. So when the dopamine level is at the baseline value, both neural populations will be weighted equally. By contrast, when the dopamine level is elevated, the information about the losses will be suppressed, while the information about potential gains will be uh, increased. So uh, this will lead to tendency of selecting such risky option, despite it having expected value of zero. This model is consistent with different experimental observations on different scales of the study of the neural system, but it also makes key novel predictions which had not been studied before. And over the last years, I had the privilege to collaborate on experiments testing these predictions. The first key prediction of the model is that the mean reward should be encoded in the difference between the go and no go neurons, while the variability of the rewards in their sum. And this prediction is currently being tested by Juan Carlos Serpa, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the group of Mark Walton. And this project is also done in collaboration with Pete McGill. So to test this prediction, we need to measure the go and no go weights. And measuring them directly would be very difficult. However, it has been recently pointed out that synaptic inputs to striatal neurons could be measured with photometry. So for example, to measure synaptic input to go neurons, we employ um, genetically modified animals in which the activity in dendrites of the go neurons emits light. And this light is measured via optic fiber implanted into the striatum. The synaptic input to no-go neurons could be measured analogously from a population of animals in which the no-go neurons emit light. And these measurements are performed in a task where the animal has to select between two options with different reward distributions. So at the beginning of the trial, the animal has to put head into a central port and stay there for one second. And then in the condition illustrated here, it has to make a choice between two options, one with small reward on all trials and another with twice as large reward, but only on half of the trials. So we expect that the signal we can measure uh, during this hold period will reflect the synaptic input to the given population and the reward distributions for the two options will be encoded in the two hemispheres of the animal. So here you can see simulations uh, of the model in this particular condition performed by Juan Carlos. So green and red curves show the value of the go and no go weights um, to which the model converged over learning and the left and right ends of this curve correspond to the two options. Since both options have the same average reward, the difference between the weights is the same, but in the case of variable rewards, the sum of the weights is increased. So do real striatal neurons behave this way? Well, we don't know yet because Juan Carlos only started the recordings, but I can show that Juan Carlos is able to record very clear signals from these neurons, uh, which differ between the different moments within a trial and different conditions of the experiments. So we will know the answer soon. The second prediction of the model is that the increase in dopamine level just before the choice should res result in higher probability of making risky choice. And this prediction has been tested by Diffield students Moritz Miller, Jan Gron, and Mike Van Svitten, who are co supervised with Sanjay Manohar. Controlling dopamine level in humans on a rapid time scale would be very difficult directly. However, from previous studies, we know that there are increases in dopamine which are produced when dopamine encodes uh, reward prediction errors. So we can expect that positive prediction errors will induce risk seeking. To test this prediction, Moritz and Jan designed an experiment in which humans were making choices between two fractals and observing rewards. On each trial, they could see two stimuli out of the set of four. And two of these stimuli had higher mean than the other, and two of them had higher reward variability than the other. 
During a trial of this task, the prediction errors actually occur in two moments, at the time of the outcome, and also when the stimuli are presented. So for example, if a participant see two good stimuli, uh, he or she may be pleasantly surprised. And this uh, will produce a prediction error representing dopaminergic activity. And we expect that this dopaminergic activity should promote information encoded in the GO pathway and result in risky choice. And indeed, Moritz and Jan has observed that the probability of making risky choice was much higher um, after seeing two good stimuli than after seeing two poor stimuli. The model also sheds a light on another puzzling phenomenon known as the experience description gap. It refers to a surprising observation that tendencies for risky choice depend whether the information about option is learned by experience as in the task which I described before or presented explicitly. So for example, Maike has uh, asked participants to perform a task very similar to the one which I described before and observed the same effect that they were more likely to make risky choices after seeing two good stimuli than after seeing two poor stimuli. However, when the same participants were asked to um, make a choice on the base of uh, options with reward distribution described explicitly, they were actually risk averse in the positive concept, context and risk seeking in the negative context. So you can see that the, in these two tasks, the contexts have an opposite effect on the tendency for risk seeking. So the behavior of humans in the description task um, has been described by the prospect theory. So we propose that the behavior is different in the experience task because here the behavior is driven by a different neural system, mainly the basal ganglia, where prediction errors in induce risk seeking. And this hypothesis is also observed with the effect of hunger, which Mike uh, um, noticed. So when the same participants were asked to perform um, the task after the few hours of fasting, um, the hunger only affected their performance in the experience task, but not the description task, which, is con which could be explained by the larger number of um, hunger-related receptors in the basal ganglia. So in summary, um, we proposed a computational model describing how the basal ganglia can learn reward uncertainty. And I would like to thank my fantastic collaborators, thanks to whom this uh, interdisciplinary research was possible. Thank you very much. Uh, great, uh, great. Thanks again for a very clear, cool talk showing how a very um, simple model based on based on on uh, on known experimental data can can lead to some really counterintuitive, interesting predictions. It's cool. Um, I am uh, again. I'm just going to give um, two. Well, maybe I'll just ask one question. Uh, and waiting for all the students to chime in with their with their amazingly interesting ones. Um, so. Many people in this audience, presumably, but many people around the world, have seen basal ganglia signals um, for uh, those explicit type of, um, of uh, gambles, as well as the implicit ones, and presumably will have got a bigger dopamine impulse when the stimulus comes on before they make the gamble um, than, um, uh, than they did for a small, for a small option. And so explain to me, just I don't understand why you don't make the same prediction there. So I think that the, um, in the explicit tasks, the basal ganglia also plays a role, right? So, so I, I think that you uh, also have a role in valuation um, in the basal ganglia. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a clear mechanistic model describing how the explicit uh, tasks are made, but I think that you, you can imagine that if you see this kind of bars with numbers, you have to uh, engage many more circuits involved in many different operations, which re would require cortex. So you would have kind of um, also other brain structures and other processes involved. I think that uh, in the valuation component of this big decision task, the basal ganglia will play a role, but you will have also many other components involved. While for the simple experience-based task, uh, well, I'm sure that the cortex is also involved, but you could probably save, uh, solve this kind of tasks 
and um, mostly with also relying on the basal ganglia. Uh, so Pierre Giorgio Salvan asks, uh, what is the role of serotonin modulating learn the learning of reward uncertainty? Okay, uh, it's a great question. Um, I don't maybe, maybe, maybe know much the about the. Okay, maybe, maybe, I'm just yeah. wondering if it's maybe in, with particular reference to the data from Jeremiah Cohen and stuff showing. Um, have you seen that? Is that right, Pierre George? Is that what you're asking about? Anyway. Sorry, I won't interrupt. Carry on. No, sorry. I, I unfortunately I don't have an answer to this. So. Um, the model on the, uh, focuses on dopamine, but it would be super interesting to incorporate the role of other uh, neuromodulators such as serotonin, but I, I don't have an answer to this. All right, thanks very much, everyone. I, I think we should move on uh, to Hairiri. Is, hi, uh, are you there? Yep, excellent. Um, so this is exciting. So we're moving uh, on to where computational stuff might be actually useful, um, which is uh, a, um, an unusual thought. Uh, so, um, Hairiri is a uh, group leader at the um, MRC BNDU um, and um, is uh, trying to work out whether computational mathematical ideas can help us um, to do better surgeries and things like that. Uh, so, uh, carry on. Uh, thanks very much indeed for coming and, and it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much for the great introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's such a great pleasure to be speaking to you this morning. Um, in this presentation, I will be describing a theoretical framework to explain how temporally specific brain stimulation can be used to restore network states. Deep brain stimulation is an effective therapy which has evolved from the cardiac pacemaker. It involves placement of an electrode inside the brain, which is connected via lead to a pacemaker implanted in the chest cavity. And similar to a cardiac pacemaker, deep brain stimulation then continuously applies electrical pulses to key brain regions. This movie demonstrates how such a system can help to treat common movement disorders. On the left, the system is off, while on the right, implanted device is active and delivering electrical pulses to the brain. As you can see, patient has a really prominent tremor when stimulation is switched off. Deep brain stimulation is highly effective in reducing symptoms on average by 80% in essential tremor patients and 45% in Parkinson's disease patients. So before we go any further to discuss how we can improve stimulation, uh, let us first dive deeper into the mechanism of conventional stimulation strategies. I will be discussing stimulation efficacy in the context of Parkinson's disease, which is a very common neurological disorder, which can cause involuntary shaking of the limbs when patients' hands are resting and give rise to rigidity, slowness of movement and gait disturbances. These symptoms are caused by neurodegeneration, which impacts in particular the dopaminergic neurons and results in large scale synaptic reorganization across the motor circuit. Going back to the brain stimulation, when stimulation is switched off, we observe that neurons within the motor circuit exhibit rhythmic activity in the beta frequency band, which roughly ranges from 13 to 30 Hertz. As we turn on the stimulation and increase the stimulation intensity, we observe that rhythmic neural activity is abruptly suppressed once we reach a critical stimulation amplitude. Because of this effect, conventional deep brain stimulation has been likened to a surgical lesion. One thing to note is the level of degrees in beta oscillations correlate with symptom reduction, which makes these rhythms quite useful to determine when and how much to stimulate. So, can we go beyond the reversible lesion effect of brain stimulation and use stimulation to recover distinct network states? To answer this question, uh, my postdoc Tim has used a computational model of the corticobasal ganglia circuit. We have used neural mass models, which were originally developed by Lopez da Silva to study the thalamocortical circuit and then extended to the cortical column by Janssen and Ritt. Each neural population, 
are described using a second order differential operator. One key component is the sigmoid function, which converts input from a presynaptic population to change in firing rate at the postsynaptic population. If you look closely at the response of these equations, these figures illustrate the change in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic population when it is driven by a short impulse. The projection between the two populations is excitatory, which is highlighted with red lines in our circuit diagram. The peak value that the postsynaptic potential reaches is controlled by the H parameter, which is a lumped parameter determining the strength of the connection between two populations. The speed with which the membrane potential returns back to baseline is determined by the time constant tau. For an inhibitory projection, the membrane potential of the postsynaptic population would reduce. And these types of connections are highlighted in blue in our circuit diagram. In order to constrain the model parameters, such as time constants and connection strengths between populations, we used experimental data obtained from the 6-OHDA lesioned rat model of Parkinson's disease. We used simultaneously recorded population signals from the motor cortex, striatum, pallidum, and subthalamic nucleus, and extracted certain data features such as the power spectral density shown here in the diagonal and non-parametric functional connectivity between pairs of nodes. It is these features which were used to constrain our model parameters. To make sure that our model is parameterized appropriately, we used approximate Bayesian computation. This is an iterative parameter estimation scheme, which is used to estimate model parameters from experimental data. We first simulated the model in time for a set of parameter values and evaluated how closely the simulated data features resembled those we got from the experimental data. Those parameter values which did not result in a good fit were rejected, while ones giving us good fits were taken forward. This procedure was then repeated until the distance between experimental and simulated data features was sufficiently small. Now, in order to answer our original question, which was, can we use well-timed stimulation to recover network states? We first need to define network states. As I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, neurodegeneration of dopaminergic neurons results in synaptic reorganization, in particular downregulation of the corticosubthalamic projection and upregulation of the pallidosubthalamic projection. Since our model parameters were fit to data obtained from 6 of HD lesioned rat model of Parkinson's disease, our baseline model reflects this reorganization. If we consider further degeneration of dopaminergic neurons, this could be reflected by further weakening of the corticosubthalamic projection, which is shown in red, and further strengthening of the pallidosubthalamic projection, which is shown in purple. If we consider the other end of the spectrum, strengthening of the hyperdirect pathway from cortex to the subthalamic nucleus, shown in blue, or weakening of the pallidosubthalamic projection shown in green would represent the dopamine intact or network states associated with symptom relief. Using these four network states, we first estimated spectral fingerprints. Our main motivation, of course, for estimating these spectral fingerprints is to use these to control stimulation parameters. So if we first look at states associated with disease progression, in line with previous experimental and clinical results, we see an increase in the rhythms in the beta frequency band. If you look at the states representing symptoms getting less, then we see a drastic reduction in rhythmic activity in the beta frequency band. 
For strengthening of the hyperdirect pathway, we also see an interesting switch where beta rhythms switch from low frequencies to higher frequencies. Previous experimental work has suggested that low beta frequencies are hypokinetic, while higher beta frequencies may be prokinetic. Next, we estimated changes that occur across the entire circuit using our simulated time series from different nodes. We first identified when beta activity would exceed a threshold and estimated phase synchrony between two brain regions within this high beta amplitude epoch. We extracted both the angle of the temporal relationship and the degree of phase synchrony. Looking at pairs of regions for states associated with symptoms getting better, which is weakening of pallidocephalonic projection and strengthening of hyperdirect pathway, we can see that these network states are associated with reduced phase synchrony in the beta band. Pallidocephalonic pathway weakening results in frequency and region unspecific reduction in synchrony while strengthening of the hyperdirect pathway weakens beta synchrony in low frequency bands from cortex to downstream subcortical nuclei and from thalamus to other basal ganglia regions. These reductions are also paired with strengthening of phase synchrony in higher beta, again, from cortex to downstream subcortical regions and from thalamus to other basal ganglia regions. When we look closely to time resolved dynamics, as we observe a high beta amplitude epoch, the temporal relationship between cortical and sub subthalamic beta quickly resets and stabilizes. For states which are linked to disease worsening and increase in beta, shown here in purple and red, the phase relationship takes, a, a, it stabilizes extremely quickly. For states which are linked to symptoms reducing and decrease in beta, the phase relationship takes a long time to stabilize, as shown here in green and blue. Phase stability between nodes correlates strongly with the amplitude of beta, providing a key metric for us to probe with stimulation in order to establish whether this is just a correlative relationship or a causal one. To explore whether we can recover different network states with stimulation, we chose subthalamic nucleus beta as our control signal and motor cortex as the brain region to deliver stimulation since cortex is upstream from both connections that we varied to define our four different network states. We used filtered subthalamic beta signal and delivered stimulation to motor cortex, which was phase locked to different instances of this rhythm. For certain stimulation phases, cortical stimulation, which was phase locked to subthalamic beta could further amplify these rhythms. For other stimulation phases, cortical stimulation could suppress subthalamic beta rhythms. Suppression of subthalamic beta rhythms in lower frequency bands, highlighted here in red, would amplify rhythms in higher frequency bands, highlighted in green, despite these higher frequencies not being targeted directly with stimulation. So, if we assume that synchrony at different frequency bands are used for segregating parallel information streams, delivering stimulation phase lock to one frequency band can have effects in other frequency bands, allowing us to potentially gate different information channels. Looking at time result dynamics, we can see that effects of stimulation on beta power are achieved by dragging the temporal relationship between cortical and subthalamic beta to different values. 
This is in contrast to the spontaneous dynamics where changes in phase were predominantly due to a transient slip followed by a period of phase stability. Finally, returning back to our original question, we used our previously defined fingerprints, both in terms of spectra and phase synchrony across the network for our four network states and determined how closely we can match these states with stimulation only. Just as a quick reminder, states shown in green and blue would represent reduction in symptoms while states represented in purple and red would indicate worsening of the disease state. Looking at population spectra, network synchrony, and combined data features, we can see that we are able to recover distinct states by simply varying the cortical stimulation phase. States related to changes in the hyperdirect pathway are much better recovered than those states linked to changes in the pallidosubthalamic pathway. We think this is partially due to our choice of sense and stimulation sites, and also the fingerprints of these network states, which are frequency and region unspecific. As a final remark, Whenever we make use of a computational model in order to make inferences and generate hypotheses, we should be aware that these inferences strongly depend on how the model has been parameterized. In order to test generalizability of our model, we have compared our simulations to experimental observations, which were not used to constrain our model parameters. And we were able to recover features linked to both disease and stimulation, and in particular, our key observation that delivering stimulation phase locked to one frequency band can have effects in other frequency bands. To conclude, phase specific neurostimulation has the potential to go well beyond the simple reversible lesion effect of conventional brain stimulation strategies. Going forward, we can use this framework not only to define states linked to disease, but also to behavior and explore the dependency between state recovery and stimulation parameters, such as sensing and stimulation pairs and stimulation intensity. Finally, I would like to thank all my colleagues and collaborators, in particular Tim, for his work on this project. And I will now take questions from the audience. Thank you. All right. Uh, so again, just a reminder uh, for all the uh, students and postdocs to place their questions there and for the PIs to place their questions as backup. Um, and maybe I'll just uh, start again. So uh, really cool to see how such a sort of complex detailed model, like real comparison to what Raphael and Andrew have showed, you really got into the complex of details of the connections and showed how uh, you can really um, uh, capture complicated dynamics. It's really amazing. Um, I So I first question that I had was, given that you fit that data to rodent oscillations and spectra, what, uh, what, uh, what are the considerations for trying to use it in humans? <laughs> yeah. uh, def definitely, that's a, that's a fair enough question. I think um, um, the, the rodent data, it's, it's, it is a very good model of Parkinsonism because it does express the heightened beta rhythms, which take over the entire cortical basal ganglia circuit. And it is also treatment responsive. So that's our sort of base starting point that when you deliver either um, apomorphine or stimulation, which in tandem reduces symptoms in the rats, you would also reduce these um, uh, rhythms. But of course, you know, unless we can record data in humans, exactly. it temporarily resolve to all these notes that we are interested in, we won't be able to know 100% that the sort of connectivity which forms a basis of our um, predictions, the sort of the projections between cortex and the basal ganglia regions, the, the leading and the lagging relationships without having a confirmation in humans with detailed uh, improvements. I guess another way of asking that question, which I think is true, is the principles that you're talking about, about these phase relationships, do they remain true if you change all the parameters? 
uh, versus, uh, or, or do you really need the exact parameters to be the same in humans and rodents for the thing to be to, to work? So that's the thing, the parameters have been fit to, because we have recordings from four regions simultaneously, the parameters represent phase relationship between all those pairs of regions we recorded simultaneously. So if I took a human data and just had it constrained with only two of the nodes, I would be in a most probably a different parameter space, still able to represent the height and feet oscillations. Cool. Um, uh, I guess one, one more question. So, so uh, and then I think we have to move on. Uh, my understanding is that for this to work in patients, you would now need two stimulators in there rather than one. Is that true? Because you need to be recording an SDN and stimulating in cortex in the example that you showed, for example, or have I misunderstood what's going on? So one of the things we can use now, um, there have been some recent uh, advancements in the brain stimulation, which allows actually streaming the depth electrodes from the depth okay. electrodes directly. Um, so we can actually use such a technology and potentially try transcranial stimulation in tandem, you know, use the DBS lead to record, but also use the cortical stimulation, which so far wasn't used because the unspecificity of cortical stimulation, but actually in this case, we can directly test this now in patients with the new technology. Fantastic, looking to see how that works. Great. Okay, I think we should move on and we're going to, um, uh, oh, I just wanted to be out something Kia just said, because I think she meant to say it to everybody. Oh, she just said it to everybody. It didn't, it didn't just come to me. Good. Um, fantastic. Um, so our next speaker is James Whittington, who um, is a sort of stalwart of Oxford, uh, has been here since he was 18, um, and is now, I don't know quite how old he is, but he uh, started doing physics um, and um, has uh, also got a medical degree somewhere in his history and is now doing computational neuroscience um, and uh, is, um, has been um, just a, a fantastic contributor to my lab over uh, the last uh, number of years and has done what I think is some really interesting work. So, so over to you, James. Okay, hello, um, so thank you. So today I'm gonna just talk about understanding representations in the hippocampal formation. So representations in the hippocampal formation are best known in space. For example, the Nobel Prize winning enterrhinal grid cells that are active on a hexagonal grid, uh, or the hippocampal place cells are active in one just spatial location. Um, there's a whole zoo of other cells though, such as these object vector cells that respond to objects or border cells that respond to borders in an enterrhinal cortex, or these landmark cells in, in hippocampus. So already, um, there's an awful lot that hippocampus seems to be representing in order to do space and also be doing it in this rather bespoke manner. Um, but hippocampus isn't just about physical space though. It also maps birds in a hexagonal fashion and sound frequencies as if they were place and grid cells on a line. And of course, as we know, hippocampus is hugely important in memories. So what we're interested in is why do all these representations look the way they do? Why do grid cells look like grid cells? And how does the same system represent space, sounds, and memories? Okay, so in the next few minutes, I'm hopefully gonna convince you that principles of generalization account for all these phenomena. Imagine you see a picture of Tower Bridge, you go east, you see a picture of the of Brandenburg Gate, go south, the Colosseum, go west, see the unfinished cathedral. And then if I come along and ask you, what happens if you go north? Well, you will already know that it's um, uh, Tower Bridge. And how do you know that? We well, you know that because you already understand something abstract um, uh, uh, um, about space um, and the abstract thing you can generalize this new, uh, this new scenario. So you, for example, you know north is the opposite of south and going in a loop takes you back to the same place, i.e. how to part integrate. And you know this because you've seen lots of spatial environments before um, and you've worked out that they consist of um, this sort of abstract uh, part and a sensory part. They sort of decompose in these two different parts. This is of course just the same for sound frequencies uh, or family trees where every, every so families where every family has the same family structure but different people. And so this is a common framework for both space and non-space. I'm going to try and show you that it unifies many of the different spatial representations of the hippocampal formation. So we're going to do this by building a neural network model, the Tolman Eichenbaum machine, whose sole goal in life is to predict these, uh, to solve these prediction problems like the one you just saw. So this model receives sensory inputs 
um, um, from lateral entorhinal cortex. It's going to have to learn about the structure of these problems, and that's going to do that in medial entorhinal cortex. And then finally, crucially, it's going to have a component that binds together um, uh, the sensory, com com uh, com sensory information to the structural information, um, and that's going to be in hippocampus. And so now if it can do this, it can be able to understand any one particular environment in the context of any of these learned abstract rules. So after learning um, and getting good at these prediction tasks, if we look at the representations in its structural neurons, we see grid cells. We see them of different frequencies of different phases. And we also see band cells. Um, and of course we see object vector cells and border cells. And so we see all the whole host of cells that we saw before, they all looked rather bespoke, but now there's something common about them. They're all trying to do the same thing. That is understand the sort of structure of your of, of these environments. So we sort of um, unify them all together. And again, we can look at the memories uh, uh, component of this machine. We see place cells and landmark cells. And so again, all of these, those hippocampal cells can be just be thought as of trying to solve, um, uh, 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 see, uh, be good memories. Okay, so that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but there's a whole bunch of other sort of interesting things that come out of this model, um, uh, and including predicting quite amazing non-spatial cells and phenomena of how cells behave in different situations. So please check out the paper um, if you're interested. And thank you. Thanks very much indeed, James. Um, uh, again, uh, any questions? We've got time for at least one, uh, one question from an enthusiastic audience member. Um, uh, it's quite difficult in these five minute ones. So um, I'm going to ask you um, something about uh, Andrew's talk. Um, so, <laughs> so do you think that uh, the kinds of uh, replay things that Andre, Andrew talked about for generalization are going to be important for understanding how generalization of these abstract structures uh, are, are, um, happen? Uh, well, I mean, so, so certainly in the case of a, a data efficiency um, uh, form, which is, is, is somewhat analogous to what Andrew is showing, um, but it's also well known, for example, in, in, in your own work, um, that uh, replay does replay these abstract structures out and seems to be important in constructing um, have these abstract task spaces. Um, so it's not obvious to me exactly how this might be done mechanistically, but certainly the data is there to suggest that it is quite important. Okay, that's the end of my question. Robin Eklund asks, that's incredibly interesting. Do you know if there also exists any notion of grid cells in other parts of the brain, such as the neocortex? Oh, absolutely. So, so I feel like Tim should be answering all these questions. Okay, so, uh, so grid cells in more spatial navigation tasks have been found in medial prefrontal cortex. And in that bird space task that I showed you, um, uh, you've got these sort of hexagonal sig firing signals also in medial prefrontal cortex. Um, um, so um, very much so, and also in humans, they, they've been, um, uh, I actually don't know where they're in, found in humans, but somewhere in that frontal cortex, maybe Tim can, um, Tim can say. I'm surprised you know what neocortex is, James. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, hang on. Um, we've got one, uh, I think we're, doing, we're not going to take any more questions. We're going to move on to, um, I think it's is it Lillian next or Hannah. Um, it's uh, Lillian next. And so Lillian uh, has come to us from Switzerland uh, to work with Lawrence Hunt um, and uh, is going to show us how some of these computational ideas can be useful uh, in psychiatry. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Um, thanks for inviting me. It's, um, it's an honor to be able to speak here. Um, yeah, so NMDA receptors, um, quite interesting um, for mental health. Um, if their function is suppressed, uh, for example, because antibodies target these receptors, people get psychotic. Um, so that means they develop delusional ideas and they hallucinate. And this is also true when we temporarily block NMDA receptors in healthy volunteers using ketamine. Um, but strikingly, the same dose of ketamine that produces these psychotomimetic effects um, can also do something very different, um, which is alleviate symptoms of depression within hours. So when we describe these effects at the level of behavior and cognition, um, we are actually quite detached from the level at which we understand what these drugs are doing to our brains neurochemically. So it's not surprising then that if we only know a person's symptoms, um, we might be having a hard time predicting which of different available um, treatment options might be effective in this individual. And my hope is that we can improve this by desc describing drugs in terms of um, the effect that they have on the neural computations um, that underlie 
behavior and cognition. So how could we explain the emergence of strange beliefs and percepts in terms of computations? Now, in learning models, we assume that um, the, the amount to which we update our beliefs is somehow proportional to the mismatch between what we expected to happen and what we actually observed. And the size of the belief update should also depend um, on our relative confidence in our new observations um, uh, and, and our um, previous beliefs. So this determines our learning rate. If this relation gets out of balance, we might e either end up with um, overly precise beliefs that become immune to updates, such as delusional beliefs, um, or we might overemphasize the data um, and interpreting uh, noise as a signal that requires explanation. So in my PhD work, um, I've identified EEG-based readouts of these belief updates in the auditory domain using um, mismatch negativity paradigms and in the interoceptive domain. And I examined the different factors that um, contribute to this ratio. For example, the stability of the environment um, scales the learning rate such that when the world is stable, we integrate information over longer time scales. But when it, the world is changing, we um, focus on the most recent evidence only. So when I use these EEG readouts to assess the effects of NMDA receptor antagonists and modulators, I found that ketamine seems to be detrimental to this flexible scaling as it impaired um, the estimation of the current level of stability in the environment. And further, the auditory MMN um, and its modulation by levels of stability um, might, might actually help us uh, distinguish between different sources of NMDA receptor dysfunction, namely um, modulation by dopamine and acetylcholine. And this is clinically highly relevant because the available drugs uh, for treating psychosis differ substantially in terms of their binding affinity to these different receptors. So what I'm currently interested in is examining um, this flexibility of belief updating, but on a different time scale. Instead of learning across trials, um, I'm studying within trial inference and decision-making tasks um, here in Oxford. And we have some preliminary evidence showing that this rapid inference is similarly sensitive to um, the statistics of the environment, um, such that evidence is integrated over longer time scales um, in more stable environments. And ultimately, we will want to reliably quantify these processes in individuals. Um, therefore, we're using novel decision tasks that require participants to continuously um, integrate evidence over several minutes um, and make more efficient use of experiment time and data in this work. So in the future, I want to assess the effects of ketamine on flexible um, timescales of evidence integration in uh, perceptual reward um, and emotional decisions and hope to identify a common algorithmic motif that underlies or at least contributes um, to these very diverse effects of ketamine on mental health. Thank you very much. Um, hi, again, uh, again, very clear, beautiful talk. Thanks very much indeed. Um, and again, I'm gonna encourage people to ask questions. Um, so I'm gonna start again. Uh, so the, the objective of this is to try to find, so obviously to build a deep understanding of the neuro of how neurochemistry affects cognition. But that aside, are you hoping to try to find neurobiological measures in behavior or an EEG that will help you guide treatment? Is that is that um, uh, the ambition? Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. Maybe you give an audience of, the, of uh, who might be clinicians a sort of sense of what those measures might actually be. Because I think maybe they didn't really capture that sense from your, from your um, uh, yeah, what would it look like for a patient uh, going through this new computational psychiatry center that you're going to run? Yeah, so um, uh, good question. So the, um, the, the things that I present before about the um, auditory mismatch negativity, for example, um, is, is a good example of where that seems um, kind of in, in reach um, uh, in, in the not too distant future. So um, the auditory mismatch is like, I'm sure you know, it's a very, very simple paradigm. Participants just have to listen to a sequence of tones. They don't have to do anything. Um, and we can record their EEG activity um, while they're doing this. And um, using uh, you know, our models um, and our uh, readouts that we found, um, we can now assess whether in a given, um, hopefully in a given participant, um, NMDA receptor dysfunction is likely to be due to um, cholinergic versus dopaminergic um, dys dysregulation. And because the, the drugs differ in terms of whether they affect one or the other, that might help um, guide treatment. And we're currently testing this in, um, in the population with schizophrenic patients. 
exciting call. I think we do actually, unfortunately, I've got other questions, but I think we have to move on because already actually it should be the end of the session, the whole session now. And we've got hands. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank, thanks again, Lenny. Uh, um, so, Hannah, are you, yeah, you're up and running, are you? Uh, I can't see your. This is, uh, anyway, this is Hannah coming up now, uh, who um, is an amazingly talented postdoc mm. working with Chris Butterfield. Um, and she's going to tell us about the, the relationship between neural networks and I think fMRI data. So, this is again. <laughs> Um, cool. So I'm going to talk about uh, neural structure alignment in humans and recurrent networks. So um, how is it that humans can understand that both space rockets and cheetahs move fast, even though rockets and cheetahs belong in different semantic categories and they don't look alike? How is it that we can abstract that notion of fast from one context to the other? Well, one theory called structure alignment suggest that humans can perform these sorts of generalizations by representing the relationship between objects explicitly. So that, for example, the speed of each animal, vehicle, or mail service could align along some common abstract axis. However, there's a problem that arises when the relationships between stimuli in one context are misaligned or differently scaled with respect to the other context. So for generalization across contexts to be effective, we need some way to realign our neural representations so that context, concepts such as fast and slow have some common meaning across contexts. So in this work, uh, we studied the neural representations in humans and recurrent neural networks um, to try to shed some light on the computational mechanisms that might permit these sorts of generalization. So humans and RNNs were presented with a series of numbers that were sampled from one of three overlapping ranges, and we call those ranges contexts. Um, and the task was to decide whether the current number was higher or lower than the previous number. And in this task, um, contextual information can be helpful in the case that you forget the preceding number. So for example, if the number 31 is presented in the high context that has numbers ranging from 30 to 40, it is probably correct to say that 31 is lower than the preceding forgotten number. So we trained RNNs on this task and found that when we made the RNNs memory fallible, they learned to use the local context to solve the task. Then when we analyzed the hidden unit activity of the network and visualized it with multidimensional scaling, we saw that the RNN had learned to embed these numbers onto three parallel number lines, one for each context, and in a way that reflected their transitive ordering within each context. And interestingly, these neural number lines were mean centered and normalized so that each embedding space stretched from less to more within the context. And this meant that a linear classifier trained to distinguish big numbers from small numbers within one context could then readily generalize to the other contexts. So just like the RNNs with imperfect memory, human participants also use the contextual information to perform this task. And when we analyzed EEG signals, not fMRI, um, recorded while participants performed this task, uh, we saw that similarly to the RNNs, uh, the representations of numbers formed three parallel lines aligned by magnitude and neural state space. And again, um, these lines were centered and compressed into a relative code so that numbers denoting more or less could be linearly discriminated along a single dimension. So together, um, we think that our results suggest how the brain might generalize magnitude between contexts to enable generalizations of relational structure um, so that we can do things like, uh, for example, understand that both space rockets and cheetahs are fast. And thanks to these guys and for you for listening. Cool. I'm totally amazed by how people have managed to um, make complicated computational things sound uh, understandable as uh, thanks thanks also hannah for, for, the, for giving a really clear excellent talk and you uh, unlike anybody else already have a question uh, from um someone in the audience jostein holgram holmgren asks uh, do you think these mechanisms are generalizable to other modalities like physical size or even abstract dimensions like social status yeah absolutely um i mean so magnitude is a really interesting one in that you can kind of imagine a magnitude code or some sort of transitive series to describe um, relationships between almost anything, um, whether that's like uh, between a color spectrum, so from red to blue, or um, height or size or any of those things. And yeah, I mean, 
the fact that we can do these sorts of abstractions between different domains um, is really awesome. And I would, I would hope that the sort of uh, alignment permits that sort of abstraction as well. But of course, we don't really know yet. Um, and so maybe I'll ask uh, um, one last thing. So, so um, your neural networks are so somehow, somehow the idea of relating the, the um, internal representations in a detailed neural network to the EEG signal, to, to a dimensionality reduced EEG signal, and is both fantastic and also quite surprising, right? That the, the, the whole, that the representations spread across the whole brain measured at the scalp will give you the same uh, dimensionality as something in a, in a, which is presumably a model of a small circuit. Um, so maybe you could comment slightly on that because it's, it's fun that it works. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree that it's kind of surprising because we only have, um, we just have like, you know, 200 neurons in, in the layer that we're recording from in this network. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it's difficult to say exactly why we get this, we get sort of comparable responses. Um, I suppose the, the interesting thing is that we see these sorts of representations emerge from the RNN when they're trained to perform this particular function. So I mm -hmm. guess it, suppose it uh, sort of suggests that there's some sort of um, Sort of like mechanistic or purposeful reason for us to uh, form these sorts of representations in humans. Cool. Uh, and there's, there's one there's one further question uh, from Rob Robin Eckland. Uh, would such magnitude codes handle discrete domains such as integers as well as real value domains such as uh, floating point numbers? And I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. So um, so we have discrete symbolic stimuli in this particular case. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought too deeply about what what constitutes a floating point number in cognition. I, I think I'd have to think more carefully about that. I'm, I'm not too sure. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, I think it's lunchtime now. Um, and so I just wanted to, to thank one more time all the speakers for very clear um, uh, presentations spanning a very broad range of where computation can give us insight into brain processes and, um, and uh, clinical uh, problems. So uh, have a nice lunch and uh, see you at the next session.